So hello, today I'm in Southminster in Essex and I'd like to talk to you about the story of Nelson's chaplain and friend Reverend Dr Alexander John Scott I've got a picture of him here Now he was the uh, Scott was born in Rotherhide in London in 1768 Alexander was the son of Robert Scott, a lieutenant in the Navy, and his mother was Jane Cowan. Now young Alexander also had an uncle, also called Alexander Scott, and he was a sea captain in the Navy. So destiny was bound to take him on the high seas. Just two years later, his father died and, and Uncle Scott, along with his aunt, agreed to raise him. But not in England, it would be in the West Indies. You see, Captain Scott commanded H HMS Lynx. We have to move forward four years and Captain Scott was in battle and he now sustained injuries losing an arm and so a young Alexander was on his way back to England. Now soon after a scholarship was arranged and education beckoned at the prestigious St John's College Cambridge and it soon transpired that young Alexander applied himself far more to his social life than mathematics. Fortunately his talents for languages was recognised by the Dean and in 1790 he had acquired a Bachelor of Arts. Afterward Scott took up a position of chaplain on the 74 gun HMS Berwick. The opportunity allowed him to hone his language skills. He's already fluent in French and he added Italian, Spanish and German to the list. These abilities were soon put to good use. He was appointed chaplain to Admiral Sir Hive Parker of HMS George. We have a picture of that as well. It's all state-of-the-art technology today look at that ship what a beauty eh so HMS George this ship was classed as a first-class warship it had a hundred guns on three decks now quickly Scott was put to good use translating and interpreting captured mail and newspapers and by 1801 voyages in the Baltic Sea allowed Scott to add Russian and Danish to his considerable ling linguistic skills. Scott then met Vice Admiral Nelson and here's a fine picture of Nelson If you look on his on this famous picture, this was given by the leader of Turkey at the time. And he wore that with pride. But um, his men said he looked like a peacock, but he was his own man and he he did his own thing. Now Nelson was at this time he was a sea captain of the 64 gun HMS Argamon. I've got a picture of that. HMS Argamon. 
this is in its last years of its service. It's actually in this pictures laying the first transatlantic cable which you can see running there. It's a famous picture of that. Nelson actually offered Scott the position of chaplain but he declined and after stating his loyalty to Admiral Parker in the same year of 1801 Scott witnessed firsthand the Battle of Copenhagen. This is a picture that shows the ships lined up. These are the Danish ships and these are the English and Scott and Parker would have been up there. The actual battle would have looked like this. You see the broadside. At this time, it was the way that battle was, was commenced. It was to line up against each other and just let them have it. No technicalities. Again, the British ultimately won this battle. And, and Scott was put to good use. The next day, Nelson landed in Copenhagen to for negotiations with the Crown Prince of Denmark. And one of the Danes turned to and now it turned to another and said in French, the disagreement might lead to renewed hostilities. Renewed hostilities, shouted Nelson, and turning to Scott, he said, tell him we are ready in a moment, ready to bombard this very night. Hurried apologies followed from the Danish. In 1802, Scott was sent on a mission to Cape Francis in St. Dominic in the Caribbean most likely to gather information in port. The return journey would be aboard HMS Topes. Here we have a fantastic picture of that ship. You can see that HMS Topes has got a, it's a fairly modern ship with a um, steam funnel in the center. This was a 38 gun ship, originally French in origin. Whilst asleep in his cabin, the Topez was struck by lightning. The bolt ignited gunpowder and cartridges above his bunk. The explosion injured Scott's jaw and blew out several front teeth. And for life, Scott would suffer from hearing and sight problems. Not to mention his shattered nerves. Now in May 1803, Scott had sailed from the West Indies to Toulon on HMS Amphion. And at Toulon he was then transferred to the Navy's flagship, HMS Victory. And by now Nelson was promoted to Admiral Lord Nelson, he was a full Admiral. And Scott was given the title Doctor and he was installed as Nelson's personal chaplain. Scott would in fact spend the next two years aboard the Victory and would indeed read through captured mail and documents. On occasions inter interrogating captured enemy officers and at other times he was acting as a translator or interpreter. Not sure if they're the same thing actually. On the 21st of October 1805, the British Royal Navy, commanded by Admiral Nelson, engaged the combined fleets of France and Spain of the, Ca of the Cape of Trafalgar in the Atlantic Ocean. It was a battle 
that would become a legend. Ultimately, the Navy won the day. Here's a picture of that moment. There's HMS Victory, full engagement. It's Mars entangled with the other ship. I'm not sure what it, which one it was. I'm not going to guess on that one. This battle would become a legend. Ultimately, the, uh, a French Marine found his mark in Lord Nelson, who was on the deck. Rece he received a musket ball to the shoulder and that musket ball then entered his lung. During the battle, Scott was below deck to be with the wounded. On his way back up to deck, it became overwhelming for him. Lord Nelson was by now badly injured and passed him on a stretcher. He then remained by Nelson's side during his last hours. Nelson died in his arms, surrounded by the ship's crew. So, he, so Lord Nelson literally died in Scott's arms. In England, Scott was with Nelson's body during the lying in state at London's Greenwich Hospital. And at the funeral ceremony, held at St Paul's Cathedral in London. You can see St Paul's Cathedral in the back there. You can see Nelson's body and state moving past on a purpose-built wagon and all the soldiers there. This is inside St Paul's Cathedral. They've built a, a raised platform there to, for all the dignitaries. So many people attended. Forgot to show you this. This is the famous painting of Nelson. And if you look in the picture, this is Alexander Scott. You can see him in his plain chaplain uniform now the Reverend John Scott he wrote this Men are not always themselves and put on their behaviour with their clothes. But if you live with a man on board ship for years, if you are continually with him in his cabin, your mind will soon find out how to appreciate him. I could forever tell you of the qualities of this beloved man, Horatio Nelson. I have not shed a tear before the 21st of October and since whenever I am alone, I am quite like a child. It was Nelson's wish that his brother would help surrender his prebendal stall at Canterbury Cathedral to Scott, but this never happened. Nelson was in fact a very good friend to Scott, and in one conversation requested his name could be carried on, as Nelson's Christian name was Horatio. Scott did in fact honour this pledge, naming his daughter Horatia Scott. An interesting note, Scott had an armchair in his cabin aboard the Victory and it had deep pockets and a collection of 450 letters were found within. These letters were taken by <coughs> boarding parties of the Victory. They were written in Spanish dating from 1804. Later, Scott's grandson donated the entire collection to
to St John's College, Cambridge. I read on their website they were looking for volunteers who could speak Spanish at a good level to translate the old letters. These, these letters had never seen the, late, the light of day since that famous battle. So if you're, if you're really good in Spanish, give them a call. In 1807, and by now, a 39 year old Scot had eloped to marry 17 year old Mary Frances Ryder, and on the 9th of July 1807, they were married in Hendon. Immediately after, she accompanied her husband to Burnham in Essex, so literally miles from here. Scott had secured himself a post as vicar in nearby Southminster. And on that note, I think we shall have a look around at the church itself. It's a shame that the church is closed. But we can have a look around at the outside. Now they both lived in the Burnham on Crouch Vicarage, which lays halfway between Southminster and Burnham. Scott took on the role of curate at St Mary the Virgin Church in Burnham. This was to supplement his meagre income. And so this, the couple settled into married bliss. Scott described himself as we're a couple of romantic fools. We spend our days reading Italian and poetry together. Mrs. Scott at the vicarage, she studied botany and the garden was full of beautiful and rare flowers, many bought by Scott himself. And so they lived happily together. They had three children, the two girls and a boy. Now the two girls would become accomplished authors in their own right. Then sadly, Mary would pass away at a very young age at a father's house in Hendon. Scott threw himself into his work, raising money for a school right here in Southminster. He also improved the education in Burnham by 1816, Lord Liverpool had offered him an appointment as chaplain to the Prince Regent at Ketterick in Yorkshire. Now today Ketterick is a, as from my understand, is an infantry training grounds, garrison of some sort for the British Army. After he was um, offered the appointment of chaplain in Ketterick, it was to the Prince Regent of Ketterick. This royal position required that he had two places to work from, or be responsible for, and Southminster carried on. And so the Reverend Alexander Scott, he packed up and he moved north to Ketterick and the vicarage also. Turned out that when he got there, it was run down and required renovations and the wages were not as expected. But Reverend Scott made the best of it. His love of reading and collecting books soon expanded and within the vicarage, a long series of shelves ran along the corridor it was stuffed with books in 40 languages. On one occasion, Scott had gone out with the intention of purchasing a fine horse to ride. 
But on visiting the bookshop, he ended up purchasing so many rare books that the horse purchase was all but forgotten. Within the vicarage, there was a long series of shelves. Ah, read, I've already read that bit. Reverend Scott, he passed away soon, sometimes, some years later. He was aged 72, which is a fair age for that time. And this was on the 24th of July, 1840. He was buried at the church of St Mary in Ecclesfield in Yorkshire. Several notes I would like to add to mention. The Admiralty, they never re recognised Scott's contribution towards the war effort. For Nelson him himself paid Scott directly to act as secretary and interpreter. In fact, the Royal Admiralty even stopped Scott's pay when he was ashore on leave. Some time later, this was reimbursed by them. It's a shame, I think, that he was not officially recognised. I also discovered that Lord Nelson was born and lived in a place called Burnham Thorpe. There's also a, a rectory, his father was in fact, he, so he lived, so Burnham Thorpe was a, was a rectory, his father was in fact a reverend and his uncle was also a sea captain in the Navy. And whatever way you look at it, both Scott and Nelson lived a full and exciting life, certainly filled with danger. Now the Scott family, they commissioned a marble plaque that is on the wall in the church at Burnham. And it's also said that the famous Scott of the Antarctic is related to Alexander John Scott. I'm not sure of this myself. I've not been able to find any connection, but I do so love history. It is also said that when Scott was here at Southminster, inside this church was the writing bureau and a mirror from Nelson's time. But anyway, he certainly had an interesting life. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much.